Welcome to Widowcast Podcast, where you learn how to find the strength to get through your journey and the skills to coach other widows. This is not your average grief group. This is your journey group. It just may show you the way to make something amazing come out of the emotional pain and trauma of widowhood. I'm your host, Joanne Philomena. I'm the best-selling author of Widowed and Widow Coach, and I'm a professional certified life coach. Let the healing and your personal journey begin. Welcome back, my friends. Let me try to get this microphone adjusted here. Sorry about that. My last podcast had a lot of pops in it because I think I was too close to the microphone. So today, let's try to get this cleaner. Uh, Today, I want to talk about very interesting talk that I just listened to. Um, It was a talk about the science of positive psychology. Positive psychology is this baby new branch of psychology. And there are a couple universities teaching this. One of them is Penn State, kind of my alma mater. And I was listening to Martin Seligman. I'm not sure I'm saying his last name right, Seligman. He is a um, professor at Penn State. And the first one to really begin focusing on positive psychology. He's described as the founder of positive psychology, but I kind of look at that with a little bit of a raised eyebrow. Sorry, sorry, Martin. I do because I think positive psychology has been around a lot longer than 15 years or the last decade. Um, A positive psychology is where life coaching sprang from, or positive psychology is springing from life coaching, and life coaching has actually been around for many decades. Um, Oh gosh, if you go back through Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar, and um, I can't remember the man's name that Tony studied with, it'll come to me, Widow Fog, there's my Widow Pass, you guys, showing it to you. They were talking about positive psychology then. They just weren't calling it positive psychology. I love that the field of psychology is formally extending into positive psychology. And for that, I owe a great debt of gratitude to Martin Seligman um, because it is taking what we do as life coaches and really giving it some strong credibility makes me feel great that this is something that I've been talking about for decades myself, and now it's become a field. Positive psychology is fascinating because the field of psychology has the resources to really back this stuff up and do studies and do them in a very clean scientific method. And I love that. And in the lecture I was listening to from Professor Seligman, he was talking about the fact that uh, traditional psychology, as a traditional psychologist, he was working um, with people who were in a state of psychosis or in a state of misery and trying to fix that, right? And then, though, moved forward to realizing what if we could take all the normal population and raise the bar on their level of happiness and satisfaction in their life? What if we could make the whole general population happier? Let's take normal people and take them to the next level, which is what life coaching does. Life coaching instead of psychology or traditional therapy that would focus on your past and kind of rehash the past with you, life coaching instead takes you where you are right now, shows you how to start feeling better right now, and looks to the future for you. It helps you turn and focus to the future of your life instead of just reliving the past day to day. 
Um, and I am big on that. So what I want to share with you today is what the professor talks about in the three ways to increase happiness in your life and some examples of this, right? He talks about um, having positive engagement with others. He talks about having a meaningful life, right? Which is really something that I teach a lot. Um, finding meaning and purpose, especially after the loss of your spouse and you've gone through that painful trauma of losing probably the most important person in your life to taking that and turning it into something that has meaning in the world and has purpose in your life to make it mean something. And that's a big step. He also talks about just sheer pleasure right? He talks about the beautiful life. People are happy who live the beautiful life, but the beautiful life is really transitory. The beautiful life is like just seeking and savoring pleasure. And I think in our society, that's where we turn the most to making ourselves feel better, to, to get more happiness in our life. And it's what my coach instructor taught me as being false pleasure. And she referred to it as false pleasure because it's not lasting. It's kind of a cover up a lot of the time. Um, so that beautiful life is, are people who are fine dining and kind of the best of everything. The beautiful life kind of falls into the category of if you are feeling a negative emotion, which we all feel negative emotions, you can't be happy 24 hours a day. And I've had people argue with me about that, like, oh, that's such a bad belief, Joanne. It's like, no, it's science. It also means that we have to have contrast of emotions. We don't know what elation even means if we haven't felt deflated before right? So you have a balance in there. There has to be a contrast of emotion. You don't know what happiness is if you've never felt sad or depressed. You have nothing to contrast it to. So without the quote unquote negative emotions, you don't feel the intenser pleasure of positive emotions. You kind of need both. And to me, the beautiful life sounds like trying to cover up all your negative emotions so that you don't experience them, right? You cover up the negative emotions with overeating. That's where I started my career as a life professional life coach, teaching people about stop overeating for permanent weight loss. And a lot of what that was, um, along with a lot of really good um, physiological advice on how to take off weight and keep it off forever, it was also looking at what is it that you are trying to medicate in your life with ice cream, with potato chips, with, you know, too much food, overeating. And it is because we are feeling an uncomfortable emotion and that scares us. So we just go eat something instead because it diverts our attention. It gives us a moment of false pleasure, covers up that negative emotion. By the way, the negative emotion doesn't really go away. <laughs> That's the bad news. It's like, as long as you're eating that bowl of ice cream, you're like just all about the ice cream. But when that bowl of ice cream is done, now that negative emotion is still simmering kind of right underneath. Plus you feel guilty for having eaten the ice cream. So that kind of temporary pleasure doesn't really get you very far. Um, by the same token, people will kind of self-medicate negative emotions with alcohol or with shopping or with gambling or with pornography. There's like lots of ways that you can buffer those emotions. So to achieve more happiness in your life with the beautiful life, it's not necessarily a lasting solution for you. And I like looking at more lasting solutions. 
The life of meaning and purpose is a more lasting solution to creating more happiness in your own life. Since I've been serving widows as a coach for four years now, I think I've been happier than maybe I've been most times in my life. It really does have a lasting, creative pleasure to it in being able to create something with meaning and purpose. Now, Dr. Seligman did share a couple of different ways to create those pleasures in your life, to create the happiness in your life that relates to these things. And I found them fascinating. And it's like, I want to try all of it. Of course, I want to try it out. I'm the guinea pig. You can be guinea pigs with me. Um, but the one that really caught my attention was he talked about what he described as a gratitude visit. Now, this is amazing because this is very similar to something I have podcasted about before, my own experience of this. The way he describes it is to close your eyes and think of somebody who is still alive today and had some kind of positive impact in your life, right? Pick that person and then write a 300 word, um, like positive review for them, telling them in this 300 word endorsement, how they touched your life, changed your life and how grateful you are for that. And when you write that thing, then he actually says, go visit the person, like go knock on their door and then read them your 300 word essay about the impact they've had on your life. Right. And he, in that action, you create so much more happiness in your life. All those positive, feel good chemicals in your body get activated doing that. Um, so that was one assignment that apparently he gives to do a gratitude visit. Now I found a better way to do this, <laughs> not bragging, but I felt like, I don't know if it was a better way, but it's just something that I stumbled across and I have shared before on here. And it was funny because I came across this idea I, it started with doing a meditation about money. Isn't that funny? Um, I had been exploring my own money beliefs and really getting into money beliefs and how so many of us have very bad money beliefs, very negative money beliefs, and that they were beliefs that were kind of instilled in us when we were still little kids right? And when we were growing up and it's what other people told us and we just accepted it. And those beliefs have been living in the back of our brain our whole life and we never questioned them, right? It's a whole nother subject, getting into money beliefs. But I find it exciting because I did so much work for myself around my money beliefs and financial beliefs and uncovered really incredible stuff. But in the process of doing all that work, I decided to do a meditation on, um, like if I won a huge lottery, like $400 million, what would I do with that money? Right. How do you, what do you do with $400 million? So I kind of went into this meditative state and thought about having all that money so that everything, every possibility was open to me in the world. And here's what I found myself doing. Like my meditation started out okay, but then it kind of took a left turn with this money. And what I was doing with all this money was I began traveling across the country to go see every single person who had had an impact in my life to thank them, tell them and thank them. And I mean, even family members, friends, old employers, old bosses I had worked under that if they had really inspired me in some way, I was going to drive to their house and thank them. Um, and as I came up out of this meditation, and I'm telling you just 
in that visualization, seeing myself going to all these people and thanking them, really just that alone, like released all these feel good chemicals in my brain, all these endorphins and dopamine. And, you know, I could tell I like felt really elated and felt amused at myself because I set out to think about how would I spend $400 million. And it turned out instead of like buying real estate and cars and private jets, I was driving across the country, going from state to state to find these people who had impacted my life. And after I came out of the meditation and I thought about it and I was a little amused and I thought, but wait, I don't have to drive to every single person to do this. And I don't have to have $400 million so that I can walk away from my business and my house and everything else and just start driving across country. I could actually buy a box of thank you cards and start writing little thank yous to all those people. And that's what I did. I bought a big box of cards and I just started writing to all the people, not all the people, I couldn't find all the people, but started writing to people who had touched my life in a, you know, or people just that I was grateful for in some way and would write a card to them telling them why I was grateful for them, how they had touched my life and thanking them and mailing that card off. It was one of the most fulfilling things I ever did. I can't, I, you know, I can't even tell you. Even, I mean, I heard back about a couple of them, but even if nobody had ever even responded to the card, th what I got out of the act of writing and mailing off those cards was amazing. It was the result of that meditation that turned into a gratitude meditation. So highly recommend that. If you can think of anybody in your past and you know where they are, that you can send them a card or send them a little handwritten note, do it. Just write and tell them like you had such an impact in my life because of the way you did this and thank them. That is a magnificent way of creating more happiness in your life, right? One of his other recommendations that really resonated with me, and I've never done this. I have, um, I have tried to like create a perfect week but not in the same concept in creating a perfect week, I would get my calendar out and I would say, okay, if I could plan my time any way I wanted to plan my time, what would be a perfect week? Like perfect week. I wouldn't have to get up before 8 a.m. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have to start anything before 8 a.m. And I plan out a perfect week. What the professor talked about, the, the, Dr. Seligman, psychologist, said, design a beautiful day. And he really didn't describe it much more than that, but I immediately caught the gist of that. Like, design a beautiful day for yourself and then go live it. Like, pick a Saturday, next Saturday after you hear this, and design what would be your most beautiful day that you could go live. And I thought about that and I thought, now what would be a beautiful day? Like for some people, it might be going to see a really good movie with a friend and then maybe go have a nice dinner afterwards, whatever. Um, it might be getting out into nature. I immediately, when he said, design a beautiful day, I immediately remembered all the days that I'd had a chance to spend by the ocean right? Whether it was by the Pacific Ocean, by the Atlantic Ocean, I've lived next to both now. But for me to have a beautiful day, part of that has to be out in nature, just appreciating nature, even if it's just in, you know, a beautiful botanical garden somewhere, getting into nature to appreciate the beauty of nature. It, to me, a beautiful day would include a beautiful meal, like no holds barred, no guilt over calories, no worrying about how expensive it was going to be. 
to just maybe with a, a good friend or even a new acquaintance to go somewhere super special and just enjoy a really beautiful meal with really paired with really fine wine and just relax and laugh, right? And I also think part of my beautiful day has to include laughter, like maybe some comedy, some time just watching a, a really good sitcom. I don't mean the mind, the dumb sitcoms, but if there is some kind of comedy, some comedy movie that you really is in a vein that you love, makes you laugh out loud. I love comedy. I love watching things that can trigger me to laugh right out loud. So, you know, you could even find a ton of great comedy specials, comedian specials on Netflix, you know, <laughs> go watch a Catherine Ryan special or whoever it is that really kind of tickles you. So what would you design in your beautiful day? And do you think that you could design a beautiful day and then go live it? How good is that? How delicious is that? To me, that just sounds delicious. Like, let me plan my Saturday to be a beautiful day. Let me plan my Saturday to get out in nature, to go elbow to elbow with the crowds at Trader Joe's. <laughs> because I love Trader Joe's. I love going and finding unusual stuff in there. What is your beautiful day? To raise your level of happiness and pleasure in your life? that is lasting pleasure, highly recommend doing the gratitude visit as he described, or as I described, you can write out gratitude cards to friends and family and just be whoever you are grateful for, write a little thank you card, tell them why you're grateful for them. Spend an entire afternoon doing that and you will be so elevated. And then design a beautiful day for yourself to live. I would love to hear back from you guys. If you do this, I want to hear about your beautiful day that you designed. And if you actually went out to do that day, live your designed beautiful day. So you can email me and tell me about it. My email um, I always have it in the show notes, but I'll tell you, because I know sometimes people don't even know where to look for show notes. So <laughs> that's why I don't do extensive show notes for my podcast. Email me at Joanne, J-O-A-N-N, -N, remember, no E for me, J-O-A-N-N, -N, at Joanne, the life coach dot com. That's my email, joanne at joannethelifecoach.com. Drop me an email. Tell me about your beautiful day or go look for our group on Facebook. It's um, Widows Empowering Widows. I recently changed the name of it by accident and then I liked it so much. I was like, let's roll. Let's roll. That's the name of our group now. It used to be Widowed Book Club because I started the group for my launch team for my first book, Widowed. And I was in there messing around with it, like, I don't know, about a week ago and was, you know, playing with name ideas, just kind of typing them in to test them out, look at them. And I typed in Widows Empowering Widows and somehow it saved <laughs> saved and changed the name of the group. I love it. We're sticking with it. Go look on Facebook for Widows Empowering Widows. Click join. I'll add you to the group and you can post in there and share with everybody how you designed a beautiful day, right? Oh, I'd love to hear your feedback on how these things worked for you. So this is just a little bit of introduction to the newer field of positive psychology that's all about increasing happiness in the normal population as opposed to trying to relieve misery, right, and psychosis. And this has been my mission because many look at widows, I think psychologists would look at widows as being part of the population that needs to be relieved of misery, and I know we have misery, but I don't think we're psychotic. I don't think that we're a diagnosis at all, at all. And I've talked about that before because, you know, doctors will automatically offer you antidepressants when you're widowed. 
Like, let me put you on an antidepressant. Well, to me, that's like the worst thing you can do. When my doctor offered me antidepressants, I just kind of cocked my head to the side a little and said, really? I think I'm supposed to be depressed. Jim just died. I think I get to be a little depressed about that, don't you? <laughs> and I'm so glad that I had the presence of mind to say that and not do antidepressants because I was allowing myself to feel the emotions of grief, which is really the way that you move through grief is by allowing yourself to feel that stuff. Now, if you had, were chronically depressed before your husband died, and now you're having even more trouble with the chronic depression. Yes, you do need to see a doctor about medications. It's, a, you know, if you have chronic depression, you do want to have antidepressants for the antidepressants for that. But if you're feeling depressed since your spouse died, it doesn't mean that you are clinically depressed. It means your spouse died right? I consider widows to be part of normal population. Surprise, surprise. But here's the thing. We are temporarily in this state of trauma and in a state of suffering because of the emotions we're feeling after the loss of our spouse. And we are in a state of confusion and overwhelm because our entire future has just disappeared. When our spouse dies, it's like your all of your future plans are just ripped out from underneath you. You're starting from ground zero again. But I still consider widows a normal population and that we can increase our happiness even if you're feeling contented at this point in your journey, you can still increase happiness and satisfaction in your life. And these are a couple of ways to do that to build more happiness and satisfaction in your life connection engagement i think it would be very interesting if the field of positive psychology could do a study on one-to-one -one engagement like going out and actually meeting people face to face as opposed to engagement online over the internet right? Because I feel like I have high levels of engagement with the classes I teach. Um, we are all on Zoom together. It feels like we're all sitting in the same room together because we can see each other. We can talk and interact. And I love that. And every new class, I feel like I've just brought in 12 new friends and everybody in the class gets 12 new friends. Well, 13, if you count me in there too. I do count me in there. All these new friends are available in the class. And I think that that engagement, it counts just as much as sitting down to lunch with girlfriends here locally, right? Sometimes even better because we get really open and vulnerable with each other in these classes because we are coaching each other. You're getting coached. You're, you're learning and transforming. It's kind of an amazing process, both in, in the widow coach certification class or in the uh, widow coaching center subscription site because that membership can connect we have a secret group on facebook that backs up all the videos and content on the site all the learning on the site so i think even social media engagement is a part of positive engagement as long as you stay off of the the storm on twitter <laughs> Twitter can turn into a real storm sometimes. I have seen people like post something just kind of blatantly wrong and boy, they get eaten alive on Twitter. So, you know, think twice about Twitter. But I do think that digital engagement counts in happiness levels. So do let me know if you design a beautiful day. I want to hear about your beautiful day. And think about doing some gratitude thank you cards to people who have touched your life in the past. Tell me if you feel it increases your happiness levels in your life. Have a really happy week. Get out there and find some joy. And I will talk to you all next week. <laughs>